Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Could everybody see? Yeah. No. It's like, it's like, <laughs> Love it. Yeah. And you can hear it too. Mm -hmm. the, we got Mark, Mark got me straightened out, so I'm a little tinny there, or a little echoey, I think. <laughs> don't, don't do don't that. Don't stand in front of him. <laughs> He'll come out. Don't stand in front of him. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll take care of you. You say it's for Yeah, you yeah, don't do it around now. <laughs> mm. Wow. But hey, it's beautiful outside, right? Yes, yeah. it is. Sounds like it's going to get a little warm this week, though. Mm -hmm. Well, I know that uh, Mark and Lori and Steve had a whole hand in doing, getting this all finished up on Friday, so thank you guys for, yes, for doing that. You. It was very yes. much appreciated. Mm -hmm. um, wow. Diane goes, I don't, that's not the communion table, is this? Yeah, it, it fits. It's it perfect <laughs> size. Yeah. So. <laughs> We're so happy to have that. That's going to make things a whole lot easier. Had to change up the way the camera's set so that we have everything centered, but it, it looks good. Cool. <coughs> and, you know, it kind of fits into uh, today's message and, and Wednesday night's study because uh, today Pastor Mark's going to be, the, the title of the sermon is Labor, Created to Create. And the uh, intro to that, uh, as it's on our website from the, uh, for the Truth Project, it says, contrary to a great deal of contemporary popular opinion, work is not a curse. Okay, well, we'll go with that. <laughs> God himself is active and creative, and he calls man to share in the joy of his activity and creativity. Labor, economics, media, and the creative arts all have a role to play in magnifying the glory of the creator. This is going to be very interesting message because my dad and I were having a conversation about work yesterday. Because um, he, his company is inviting him to their 75th anniversary after he spent uh, just about 46 years there, which is something you don't hear a lot about anymore. Um, here, in just a few short weeks, we'll be doing Orange Trap Racing again here on the 13th. And then after the September races, the Saturday following the September races, we will be having a free movie. And the name of the movie is Tulsa. And it literally is about that little girl and her dad who didn't know she existed. That's going to make for an interest. Yeah, like Mark said last week, we have plenty of tissues, but it shouldn't be quite as bad. But we have plenty of tissues. So we're looking forward to, to showing that. It seems like forever before that's going to get here, but blank and it'll be here. So. We'll have uh, tickets that you can share with folks and uh, messages going out on our social media accounts and our website so you can share those on your social media as well uh, just to, to build and generate some excitement for that. Now our call to worship this morning comes from Genesis 2, chapter 5, or Genesis 2, verse 15. That's a, be a long chapter, wouldn't it? And it's very short. Mark goes, did you see how, what the size of the ass? And wow. But the power in this verse, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. You see, the thing we have to remember, this is before the fall. This is before they ate that fruit. We were designed or created to create. We were created with a God-given purpose. We weren't meant to sit idly about, even though sometimes that's a really good thing to do. But what did God tell us in the beginning? He worked six days. By his example, he worked, God worked six days. So if God works, we should be able to. But he rested. So we have to take time to rest. But this is about living a life of that is rewarding and in obedience to God's command. Sin will have changed what work looks like. Remember the hard plow for the man and uh, labor for the woman. But it's still not a curse. And your work matters. I go to work every day that I work with the intent of glorifying God through it. Even if I'm not feeling it that day. It's about glorifying God. And Paul reiterates all of this in Ephesians 2. Um, verse 10, where he says, For we are God's masterpiece. He 
has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Father God, as we come before you this morning to hear the message that you have given to Mark, how we are created to create, how it is not a curse, how it is something that we should do for your glory, to show your glory and your you in this world, Father. Let us do the things that we do in excellence, because you didn't create us as junk. We shouldn't create other things that way either. Open our ears to hear what Pastor Mark has for us this morning. Let us take it into account and let us use it as we go forward in our daily lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So hopefully not too many whoa, squeakies and squealies today. We'll adjust that back a little bit. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. How's everyone doing today? Good. Well, look at that. Isn't that a beautiful day outside? Yes. This is the day that the Lord created. Let us rejoice yes. and be glad in it. And I think we really, really need to grasp hold of that and live it out each day. So I have a question to you. How many of people here are morning people? You know, we <laughs> jump out of bed right away in the morning, ready to face the day, right? Most of us get up and say, oh, man, this is great. Good morning, God, and cheerfully start off our day. Uh, others of us, not so much. Um, get out of bed sluggishly and set off to make the donuts. Ready for another day of toiling and menial job. Blech. So how many of us actually take a look at our jobs as a way to create our future? See, if we look at it that way, it's our opportunity. We, we don't look at it as a job, as a, as a toil, as a task. We look at it as an opportunity to create, creating our future instead of being a means to an end. So a way to pay the bills, just, you know, get by day to day. It's a matter of perspective. If we can go out and create our future and we have an opportunity to do so, then, you know, we need to, to grasp that opportunity. We're only given a finite amount of time on earth. And so we have to grasp those opportunities as we can and take full advantage of them. So we can create our own future by what we choose to do. See, a lot of people go through life and they think they're trapped in their existence, they're trapped in a menial <clears throat> job, and it's a dead-end job, and then they, they kind of just kind of slug through each and every day just to make that paycheck to pay the bills at the end of the month. But that's not really creating a future. So God created the heavens and the earth, but did he do it begrudgingly? You go, oh yeah, I gotta get up today, I gotta go create the heavens. You know, I gotta go create a mountain today. I really don't think so. I really don't think so. When we create something, it usually brings us joy to ourselves and to others. It gives us a sense of fulfillment. And we were talking about that this morning uh, when we came in and, and you know, I was, I was listening to Doug and he says, oh, I start my second job this week, tomorrow. And, so he's got a first job and a second job and wow. you know and i was i was listening to, to don as well and i'm i'm going wow you know these guys are getting on track to build their future exactly what we're talking about today so i don't think god went about creating the earth begrudgingly we need that sense of accomplishment we need that sense of joy so if we remember what the scriptures tell us about what god said you know, as soon as he created something, he looked at it and he said, it is good. It is good. He had that sense of accomplishment and it brought joy to himself. So I want you to just kind of take this mental picture. So God just got done creating all these wonderful things. He just kind of steps back and goes, yeah, yeah, this is good. This is good. But creating, if you look at work as simply work, 
instead of an opportunity to create something, then you're going to have a whole different mental attitude. And I kind of want to talk about that because what God intends is exactly what I was talking about. He wants us to step back and when we're done at the end of the day, go, hey, it was good. It's a good thing. That's what God intends for us. He created us to create. And in order to do that, we work at creating. Now, as Terry mentioned in Genesis, it talks about that. And in the, in the uh, call to worship this morning, I, I kind of hit on a little bit of the topic. But God put man in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And so after the fall, man still had to work at it, but God cursed the ground, so it was going to be a lot harder. Notice he didn't curse man. Notice he didn't curse work. He cursed the ground. Man had to work. There's a big difference. So in God, in Genesis 2, it tells us about how God works and how he set the example for us to follow. Thus the heavens and earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day for all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. So I want you to think about that because then what happens next? God put man then into that garden of Eden to work it and keep it. So God created this whole thing and he builds the basis and he builds the foundation for man to go and work. And then man has that opportunity then to create from there. And what a world we've created. We really have. So we have worked it and kept it. Sometimes good, sometimes not so good. Sometimes you have a good job, sometimes you do a good job, sometimes, well, you know, you got to go back and do it over again. You know, one of the favorite things I always say is, why is there never enough time to do the job right, but there's always time to go back and do it over again, right? Yeah. So if we, if we take our time and we create and we work at that, as the, job, as the scripture says in here, to work it and keep it. Work should not have a negative connotation to it. It's an opportunity for us to create. So what is work? Well, I want to read you instead of from the 1862 version of Webster, I want you to listen to what the modern dictionary uses. It uses over 1,036 words to define one word, work. And that's exhausting. It really is. That took a lot of work, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> so work is an intrinsic verb, which means it's transitive. It can change itself as it goes through. And it's also an intransitive verb, meaning it's, it's finite in, its, in what it does. But it's also a noun and it's an adjective. So depending upon how you use the word work, depends on what it is. And that's a lot of stuff for one word. So work can be a wonderful thing or it can be a very, very <coughs> bad thing, depending upon what you choose and how you view it. So your attitude determines your altitude. I've said that many times before, but I really, really want you to understand what the difference here. Your attitude determines your altitude. How far you're going to go, how high you will rise, what kind of future you will have depends upon what your attitude towards any given situation is. So if we look at work as a menial task, as a mean to an end, and just a way to pay the bills, your attitude kind of drops right down to the bottom. And it's really, really hard at that point in time to see that you're going to have much of a future in that type of job. But if we keep a positive mental attitude, if we, if we look at that as, hey, I have a chance to build something here, I have a chance to create something here, then we have that sense of accomplishment. And we build upon that sense of accomplishment day after day. And guess what? We are now building a very bright future, very different from 
the meaning of task and just simply a means to an end. And I know of people that have a very, very nasty job to do it, but they still do it with a positive attitude because they know it's not going to be their life's work, but just a stepping stone along the way to going and doing and building something better for their life. Every one of us has probably had kind of a menial job at some point. That I know I have, you know, but along the way, it was a stepping stone to give us a learning point to learn and build from, to build on to that future that we really wanted to have. God uses those things as stepping stones in our lives. If we present the question of work to a cross section of the population today, though, you're going to probably receive a wide variety of answers. Unfortunately, within the con context of contemporary culture that we are in right now, it's an increasingly likely number of those are going to be negative in response to what work is all about or what their job is. Many people use phrases as it's a bummer. That's what I have to do to make money. And it's the only way to get to Friday. <laughs> And that's how they describe their feelings of work. What do you think their work's going to look like? What do you think their attitude is going to work like? What do you think their life is going to be? Because see, if they start that day off, whether it's my only way to get to Friday, are they going to want to spring out of bed and go and create something really special in their lives? Or are they just going to make it day to day? They're just going to make it day to day. That attitude determines their altitude. Even Christians sometimes reverence the fall as a support of their view that labor is nothing but a curse. Work, it's a means to an end. If I want blank, I have to work and fill in the blank, whatever it happens to be. A negative attitude will always bring negative results. Negativity attracts negative outcomes. Mm -hmm. And conversely, a positive attitude brings upon positive results and it works every time it's tried. So why do have people have such a negative view of work? Well, in today's culture, the view of work is generally negative and considered a curse. If we look at Genesis 3.17, this is likely where some of that notion might come from in believers. And it says, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tr tree of which I have commanded you, <clears throat> you shall not eat it. Cursed is the ground because of you, and in pain you shall eat out of it all of the days of your life. Woo. Yikes. Now, wives, we just had our anniversary yesterday, so... That wasn't pointed at you. It's, it's, it's in the Bible. Just, just kind of wanting to smooth over that one real quick. Yes, yes. <laughs> but the thing about it is they, they look at that and say, well, you know, work is a curse because it says so in the Bible. But it doesn't. It says the ground is cursed and when you work it. And when it came to the women, he said, your labor will be painful and long. Notice what, what term was used there, labor. Labor is associated with work, so therefore it becomes negative. But see, God in his infinite wisdom, even though it's called labor, you have to understand that whole process is to do what? Create new life. That's the process of labor. It's the birthing process. You are creating something very, very special. You are creating a new life. That might be painful, but in the end, you've created something very, very spectacular. Anybody who's his parent, you know, you've got that place in your heart. Maybe other people don't have such a place in your heart for your kids, but for their own, we have that special feeling, that special place in our heart as parents, because we know we have created something that could be very, very, very special. So that's how we have to look at it. Notice it didn't say anything about the birth as being negative or being cursed. Just one portion of it. You're going to feel the pain. Okay? You with me so far? Okay. So it goes on to say, 
Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you were dust, and to dust you shall return. I think God was a little upset, you know? I think he was a little upset at that point in time. If God gets upset, I think this was the point in time where he was upset. He had just got betrayed by his most perfect creation. If we read the Bible and here we read back in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, he created man and he was perfect. He created a garden of Eden, which was perfect. He created everything without sin and it was perfect. And then by man's own choice, he made it imperfect. And so therefore, by that choice, we have to live until later on. And we know what the rest of the story is. I digress. So we certainly would have a low opinion of work if we read what we read through here incorrectly. What God really did was design for us inside a sphere. He created a world and gave it to us to work. And I want you to think create here, not work. That we were created to care for his creation. From that work, we would reap the benefits of food, shelter, a literal world of all kinds of possibilities. Does that sound negative to you? Not whatsoever. See, God's design for this sphere that we have here was this labor sphere was in conjunction with all the other things he created. And that's kind of fuzzy, but it's hard to take those slides off. But it provides us with food, clothes, housing, medicine, transportation, communication, water, gas, electricity. It funds literally everything we need for our lives. So if it gives us those opportunities and those kind of things, how can it really truly be such a bad thing. All material goods are created within that sphere of labor. However, dun, 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 we have the dark side. And in the dark side, it also creates drugs, abortion, gambling, pornography, movies and music, which may not be necessarily negative. Genetic engineering, Enron, it <laughs> funds everything, everything. But see, positive or negative, it all, really all comes down to how we manage ourselves and if we are good stewards of what God provides for us. This goes back to that positive and negative aspects of our behaviors. It all depends on what our choices are throughout our lives depends upon what comes up in here in that sphere. Think about that once. See, that sphere is a reflection of God's nature. God worked and saw that it was good. God stamped us with his divine image and has given us the privilege of being his creative stewards to work on his behalf. And as such, we have been given and will multiply to the glory of God. Conversely, if we are working against the will of God, working solely for materialistic things, we're glorifying Satan and his worldview instead. It's all a matter of perspective. It's all a matter of what choices we make in our lives. Our general economic model and, and our seven economic principles that we'll study on, on Wednesday, I'm not going to take you through all seven or we'd be here and you know till two or three o'clock in the afternoon anyway uh so number one all things belong to god god created all things therefore they belong to him and that comes from psalms 57 through 12. so our materialistic drive is a reflection of satan's lie that says more stuff's going to satisfy us and nothing can be further from the truth because all things really belong to God, not to us. We're temporary stewards of everything that he has put here for us. Mm -hmm. We have to understand that and we have to live it out accordingly each day. Mm -hmm. Therefore, 
we can either say good morning god or we can say hmm time to go make the donuts <laughs> so we have an opportunity to shape and form the rest of our lives god appointed man to be a creative steward of his goods and ownerships that comes from genesis 1 28. so we're going to take a look at some of those principles as we go through here the definition of a steward in economics is management authority of God's goods. Now, I like that. That's a really good one there because it really puts everything in perspective immediately right up front. We, are man we have management authority of God's goods. We are given domain over the things that God created, so we must preserve and protect them as well as put them to our use. That's what God did when he put us to work and keep those items that he created. So if we go in here for a proper biblical attitude of employees and employers, we have to think about that as well. You know, as an employer, I had a lot of employees underneath, you know, underneath me and as a manager and managing corporations as I have throughout most of my life. I had a responsibility to those people. And even when the flood of 2008 happened and our business got wiped out completely, we still continued, Lori and I did, out of our pockets to make sure that our employees didn't miss a paycheck. We funded them out of our pocket. We didn't have income coming in, but we made sure that our employees never missed a paycheck. Their health care was taken care. We had a responsibility as stewards of what God had given us in that company to make sure that the employees were taken care of. You have to have that kind of attitude that you have been blessed with this to be able to bless others in the process. And if you don't have that perspective and if you don't operate, then you're not being a good steward of God's gifts and blessings to you. So the second point, or I'm sorry, third point that we want to kind of cover briefly today is that coveting and theft of another goods is wrong. So God put that right in, in the uh, commandments in the Bible that, you know, you shall not steal. Because stealing, you're taking away from something that can be used for someone else. And I look at that a lot of times and I see, you know, uh, I've had employees that stolen from me several times. Mm -hmm. Now, they always get caught. I'm not sure why they do it. Mm -hmm. You know, then of course you're not gonna employ them any longer. So they lose their employment. They lose the ability to take care of their families and their kids and everything. Mm -hmm. Their short-sighted gain that they thought they were gonna get in the end cost them a lot more than if they hadn't done it to begin with. So it's a, our, our function then becomes uh, matter of our choices that we make. If we make good choices and if we retain ourselves as good stewards, God gave you a good job. If you work that job, guess what? You're going to reap the benefits. But if you try and shortcut it and steal and, and cheat and those kind of things, guess what? You're going to reap those benefits as well. And those are not going to be positive benefits. They're not going to help you build that future. So uh, the other thing I want to hit, point number four, is our skills and ability to work comes from God. God kind of points us in different directions through our lives so we can learn all kinds of things so that we can develop a skill set to be able to do the work that God has planned for us in our lives. And if we look at it that way, then we know that we are using that opportunity to do build our future. And so we're going to not do it begrudgingly. We're going to go out there and say, I'm going to do the best that I can do in here to learn everything that I can learn. Like a huge sponge, I'm just going to soak it all in because I know God's going to use that later on for my benefit. And I'll reap the benefits in the long run. My family will reap the benefits in the long run. My community will reap the benefits in the long run. It's a matter of choices. It's a matter of attitude. How we look at things. The perspective that we take on any given situation will determine our altitude, how we act and react, and how good we are then at being God's stewards of what he has entrusted us with. Skills. 
See, it goes all beyond materialistic things. I haven't mentioned one materialistic thing yet. It goes way beyond that. We don't have to have all the stuff. We have to be good stewards of what we've been entrusted with. That's the key. So I want you to, to understand this. We need to love God and not our goods. Love God and not our goods. So when we take a look at that, then if we love God and not our goods, then we're not going to be focused on the materialistic things. I'm getting all this stuff. And there's an old saying that goes for the greedy in this world. He who dies with the most stuff wins. <laughs> well, yes, they do. They went a free trip to hell. <laughs> See, it's Satan's big life. You store up treasures in heaven. They will last in eternity. Why amass stuff on earth? You can't take it with you when you die. Mm -hmm. It all becomes for nothing at that point. Mm -hmm. Your life's work will become useless in an instant when you die. If you were working your entire life just to amass stuff, to win, win what? <laughs> what are you actually winning? Mm -hmm. You get to brag that you got a lot of stuff. And when you die, all that stuff just kind of goes off to the side. Life ends eternity where? In Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he says in Matthew 6, 19 through 24, Do, Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them. And where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy. And thieves do not break in and steal. See, wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And as the, as the scriptures tell us in there, your eye is a lamp that provides light for your body. And when your eye is good, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is bad, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think will actually have darkness, how deep? that darkness is. No one can serve two masters, for you will hate the one and love the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. I don't think there's probably a better life lesson for most people in this world than to go through that section on the Sermon on the Mount. Because it really puts everything in perspective. Don't listen to Satan and all the lies that he who dies with the most stuff wins. I don't think you want that trip. I don't think you want to win that set of sweepstakes. Mm -hmm. Instead, do God's will. Store up those treasures in heaven. Those are going to last you in eternity. When you die, guess what? You get more. Because you get to go be with God and with Jesus. And all the treasures that you stored up on earth are waiting there for you in the place that he has built for you. Huh. Matter of perspective, isn't it? So we need to be compassionate and generous with those who are in need. That's part of our charge. That's part of being the good stewards is that we have to be compassionate and generous with those who are in need. When God blesses you for what you're doing, he wants us to pay it forward to those who are less fortunate. And that's what I was talking about with the employee-employer relationships. That's part of being good stewards of the gifts that God gives us. It's a responsibility for the poor. So, that's a tough one in society today because there's a lot of people who misunderstand what that's all about. We're going to kind of touch on some of those things because I think it's very, very important to understand it. And this goes all the way back to Old Testament teaching in Leviticus. But the scriptural mandate to show compassion to the poor comes from God's word. He said he wants to set these things aside. He wants you to understand that it's your responsibility for the gifts that you've been given to give who are to those who are less fortunate. The poor still need to work 
in, in the sphere of labor, it has that primary responsibility to provide those work opportunities for those who are less fortunate. So let's take a look at Leviticus 19, 9 and 10. When you harvest the crops of your land, do not harvest the grain along the edges of your field and do not pick up what the harvesters drop. And it's the same for your grape crop. Do not strip every last bunch of grapes from the vine. And do not pick up the grapes that fall to the ground. Leave them for the poor and the foreigners living among you. I am the Lord your God. God even wants the poor to have the opportunity to work for what they get. Yes, opportunity. We were endowed with a sense of self-worth. That when we work, when we create, it brings joy. It brings a self uh, a feeling of self-worth and a sense of belonging. It makes us feel like we are a productive part of society. Now, for some that are severely afflicted mentally or physically, it's our duty then to care for those who cannot care for themselves. I want you to really grasp a hold of that. As we were talking earlier this morning, and many of you know that I served on the board of directors for Hawkeye Area Community Action Program here at HACAP. And I did it for several years. I was the chairman of the food reservoir, and we talked about the food reservoir today. And, uh, and Doug was telling me how he took care of the food pantry down at Mission Hope. And it's how we pay back and how we pay forward for those gifts that God's given us. It's interesting to note that how many people wanted a hand up, not just a hand out. We think of those poor who, who cannot provide for themselves or do not provide for themselves. All they want is much, as much as they can take. But there's a lot of those who want the hand up so they can improve their lives. I look at these guys here and they say, hey, we've got a goal. We want to get off the streets. We want to do this. We want to be able to provide for ourselves out here. And they're knocking them out of the ballpark. They want a hand up, not a hand out. They want to be able to build and create that future for themselves by being given those opportunities to work. Wow. Given the opportunities to work. It gives that person a fulfillment that God has planted in their hearts. As we look at society today, however, there are those who are just looking to get anything they can by playing the system. But see, they're only fooling themselves because they really get no benefit, no real benefit, because then they become dependent upon the system. Then they have to have, have to live that life subjugated to the state to provide for them. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm dry. But see, that's not how God created us. God didn't create us to be subjugated to the state, to depend on somebody else. We have to depend on God. Ooh, not the state. We need to go to God. God will then provide for us if we come to him with that heart. God will provide for us, not the state. He created us to work for what we get, to provide for those who cannot provide for themselves with the abundance that he gives us. <coughs> Excuse me. Ephesians 4, 28 and 29 tells us, if you are a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good, hard work, and then to give generously to others in need. Don't use foul or abusive language, and let everything you say be good and helpful, so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear it. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing you that you will be saved on the day of redemption. It's that matter of attitude. It's that matter of perspective. It's understanding that God created each and everything. Each and every one of us, every job is created by God. If we go into it with that perspective, if we go into it with that attitude, guess what? We got a great outcome on the other end. Because it's all part of God's plan. Yes, please. <laughs> Need a little water. <clears throat> That means I'm 
talking to you about your butt. <laughs> so likewise, Jesus warns us not to be boastful when we give to the needy. And I, I got to tell you, there's so many times that, you know, you look at someone who's been endowed with great gifts from God. And they have been blessed overflowing. And then they, they greed and pride set in. And I want my name up on this. I want everybody to recognize that I gave the money for this. This is me. Look what I did. But Jesus warns about that in Matthew 6. Watch out. Don't do your deeds publicly to be admired by others. For you will lose the reward from your Father in heaven. When you give to someone in need, don't do as the hypocrites do. Blowing their trumpets in the synagogues and in the streets to call attention to their acts of charity. I tell you the truth. They have received all the reward they will ever get. But when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. <coughs> give your gifts in private. And your father who sees everything will reward you. See, that's the definition of compassion. He who gives to the poor will lack nothing, but he who closes his eyes to them receives many curses. The righteousness care about justice for the poor, but the wicked have no such concern. When we talk about compassion, we talk about helping our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Helping, what, using what God has given us to help others who can't help themselves. So on Wednesday, we're going to be covering some additional information on arts and the media and all kinds of different things. Do we have a truth issue in our arts and media for the world today? Whoa. And the thing I think is going to be most important on Wednesday is we're going to be covering what is called Soli Deo Gloria, for God's glory alone. What I want to, want to have you leave here with today is we need to have the same perspective that God would be glorified all that we do every day of our lives. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, you've given us so many opportunities. You have blessed us in so many ways. Lord, help us to be good stewards of what you have given us. Help us to be good stewards and understand that your will is good and glorious and gracious. And if we simply follow your will, as you have commanded us to do, we will have a wonderful life. We will be overflowing with blessings from you, Lord. Help us to stay on the right track. Help us to follow you. Help us to submit our way, our will to you. We want to change our ways, Lord. Guide and direct our hearts to do so. Thank you, Lord, for your word, for the messages, for the programs that you put in our path throughout our lives to help us get us back on track when we're straying from you, when we're straying from that path, when we're straying from the plan that you have for our lives, help us to get back on track. Help us to understand, learn, receive these words, and most importantly, to live them out mm -hmm. with your grace, your mercy, and your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. As Mark was giving the message, I was thinking about um, communion and, and that was coming up and what that, how that ties into the message that we got today. Think about what Jesus did. Did he just sit back on his laurels and do nothing? For the first 30 years of his life, what did he do? He was a carpenter. He worked 
move just like you did. He looked like his father taught him. And then he went into ministry, and I'm sorry, people, for those of you that may be watching online or wherever you are, ministry is not a Sunday only or Wednesday night only thing. It's something that, and it's not spending hours, countless hours of preparing a message. It's so much more than that. It's, it's being available. It's, it's actually doing the work, being the hands and feet, being the example for everyone. And that's what Jesus did. And then he kept it. Because he's not, his work is almost finished at this point when he's having this meal. And he breaks the bread with his disciples and says, this is my body broken for you. Take. And then towards the end of the meal, he took the cup and after filling it, he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for the sins of many. Take. Scripture reminds us as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we're to do so until Jesus returns because he tells us he will not eat or drink until his kingdom comes. should for you. Take and drink. Heavenly Father, we give thanks for you for all that you do for us. As we are reminded through this meal that we take and partake in each week, we know it's in remembrance of what your Son did for us. What you did for us. How we, as your children, are blessed. How by our belief in you and our relationship with you that we are redeemed. Father, we pray, pray for a repentant world. A world that would remember, repent, and return to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good, morning. Good morning. And happy anniversary, Mark and Lori. Thank I hope you, you had a blessed day yesterday. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Oh. Okay. <laughs> and we want to praise God for all the jobs that happened this week for Diane and for Doug and, and Don. You all three were blessed with a wonderful job last week and this week, and we just praise God for that. So. Anyway, is there any other um, prayer requests this morning? That's Harold? Yeah. Prayer for Harold, yeah. He's just not feeling very well. So. Okay. Okay. Just a prayer of thanks for all the blessings in my life. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, Father God, we thank you today for all you have done in each of our lives. <clears throat> For loving us unconditionally, for walking with us through every storm that comes our way, for random miracles and the grace that you bestow upon our lives. There are so many things in this life that we take for granted. We ask for your forgiveness for not acknowledging you in all these things. For without you, who could stand? In the depths of our sadness, you are there. In the midst of our pain, you are there. When people rise up against us, you are there, interceding for us. We praise and thank you for who you are, Father God. For thankfulness is the seed for joy, and love conquers all things. So we thank you, God, for all the jobs you've provided and all the blessings you've given to each and every one of us. And Father God, I want to pray for all the women that are running to the Planned Parenthood sites to get an abortion. Father God, they do not realize the consequences of their actions. Help them to understand the meaning of life. In Psalms 139, 13, 15, 
For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. Let them not conform to the world's ideas of when life begins, but to the knowledge and wisdom of your word. For those that will listen, help them to find you, and let them listen to your word, and know the truth, and not to accept all the lies of this world. Change their hearts, O God, because this country needs your help and wisdom, Father God. I, writ, I lift up Harold this morning. Just be with him, Lord God. Comfort him. Give him strength for each new day. Just um, walk with him daily, Lord God, and give him your joy and peace that comes by knowing you. I lift up Richard, Richard's mom, to you, Lord. You know her needs. Be with the caregivers and that know so they will know how to help her Lord Jesus and let the blood of Jesus flow over her and heal her body. We ask for safe travels to Mark as he travels to and from work. I pray God's protection always over you. I ask for safe travels for my daughter Carrie and son Jace as they travel to and from Texas to be with her older sons Riley and Dylan. May God keep them safe everywhere they go, and I pray many blessings on their time together. May it be a time of healing hearts and restoration of their family. We pray for safe travels and no car trouble for Bill and Carla as they travel to and from Montana to see their family. I pray a hedge of protection around all of them, Father God. May joy and peace be with them wherever they go. And Father, we look to you for all things. Let us not forget Psalms 121, 1 and 2. I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. In Psalms 113, 2 and 3. Let the name of the Lord be praised, both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun and the place where it sets, the name of the Lord be praised. In Jesus' holy name. We thank you for all things. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Uh, I really look forward to your prayers each week, so I feel that God has really blessed you with that ability to be able to intercede for others, and, and you do it quite well, so thank you very much. This ends our online portion of our service today. Um, if you follow on with the notes that we have as we post them up, you'll have links to the songs uh, so that you can follow along with those songs that we have. Let's go to God. Dear God, help us to live a life full of faith that is devoted to you. We want to have a heart that pursues you before anything else, before the things of the world. And you said, if we seek you with all our hearts, we will find you. Thank God. Help us to keep our focus on you and your will. Align our will with yours and help us to keep your commands. Lord, we want to live a life of obedience and faithfulness to you. Lord, we know that you will not let us be tempted beyond what we can bear. Lord, that you will step in and you will take over and I pray that you would provide a way out for us whenever we face temptations and the courage to turn away from them. And when sin and temptation knock, help us to focus instead on your goodness, on your love, on your grace, and on your mercy so that we can resist them. Lord, we pray for strength whenever we face difficulties and times that seem to over overwhelm us. Lord, we need to be reminded that you are there walking hand in hand with us and we lift each worry and burden up to you because we know that you are greater than anything that we may face and in that remind us that we can do all things through christ who strengthens us and that we may gain strength from doing things that bring you joy that we pray for that life of discipline Teach us how to be a good steward and guard the minutes and hours that you've entrusted us 
with on the earth here so that we can be good stewards of the gifts and the blessings that you provide us with. And we pray that the desires of our hearts will be aligned with yours so we can shed those unhealthy habits that we all have. Thank you for being our strength, our protection, our provider, Lord Jesus. In your holy name we pray today.